Welcome to the It's Time podcast with your host, Professor Dale Feinauer from the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh College of Business graduate programs. Welcome to another It's Time podcast, an offering of the UW Oshkosh College of Business graduate programs. I'm your host, Dale Feinauer. Once again, we're here at AJ Armstrong Studios to help throw a little more fuel on the flame of your desire to enhance your business management skills. Today, as throughout this first season, we're focused on leadership. Today is another Dale day. This is not an interview one. This is a podcast where you get, you get me, sorry. And today, though, we're going to be talking about a fascinating topic, generational differences. <clears throat> now, many of you have already had a number of exposures, I'm sure, to generational differences. You've thought about generational differences. I'm sure that almost all of you have been frustrated by generational differences and angst that that has produced in terms of your ability to lead your organizations. We want to think about that. But this is a little different take on generational differences than is the, the norm that we typically get. So I want to think first about why generational differences exist. We're going to talk about that, and that's really where the big difference is. Then we want to think a little bit about what are the criteria, what are the aspects that are different across generations. Think about what we can do about that. How do we manage these generational differences? First, why do generational ex differences exist? We think there are really three reasons why generational ex differences exist. The vast majority of the discussion tends to focus on the first of these three what we call the cohort effect. The cohort effect is the idea that individuals, a generation, is impacted by the things that happened to their generation, historically, if you will. People who grew up in the Great Depression, more likely to be cost conscious, more likely to be frugal with their dollars than somebody uh, who grew up not in the Great Depression. That sort of a concept. There are differences across the generations driven by what the world was like for them. This is a big impact. Next, though, we're going to talk about the, the cohort effect, the age graded effect, lifestyle effect. It's referred to as many different things but that people are different as they age because of the age they are. And we'll talk about those two, then we'll move into the random effect. People are just different. It's a fairly short discussion. But let's go back to this concept of the cohort effect, the concept that people are different based on the generation that they're a part of, based on the question of what has happened to them as a group as they've grown up. We know that 13 to 18 are the critical years. If you really want to understand somebody, and this is an important point in addition to it being useful for generational differences, if I want to understand somebody, I really want to screw myself into their head what they're like, I need to understand what they were like, what their world was like when they were in that 13 to 18 age group. Now, I know a number of you are freaking here and going, wait a minute, wait a minute. Junior high, I, I was an absolute geek. That was terrible. Don't tell me that the rest of my life is driven by what I was like at 13. Not necessarily saying that. But your basic personality, to a large extent, is formed by the time you're 18. Certainly things can happen in life that can be these big life-changing events. But most of who we are is pretty apparent by the time we're 18. So if you want to think about generational differences, it is very useful to think about, as I mentioned in the, the beginning of this podcast, what's different for a generation? Growing up in the Great Depression causes you to view the world a little bit differently. My mother shares that when she was a very small child, her bedroom was under the dining room table. Her parents had moved in with her grandparents because Great Depression, they, they didn't have money, and there just weren't enough bedrooms, so her bedroom was literally under the dining room table. Well, my mother's a frugal person. Is the fact that she's very frugal related to this? Many of us would come to the conclusion that's true. And that's a generation that had relatively high savings rates, a generation that was relatively focused on being frugal with their dollars, focused on saving, focused on getting the best buy, if you will. So that impact, growing up in the Great Depression, impacted the way they viewed the world. 
my generation, I, I, I'm 65, grew up in, in the 70s, if you will. We were impacted by a number of things. We were impacted by, clearly by Vietnam. We were impacted by Watergate. We were impacted by drugs. And I would say the takeaway from my generation of all three of those was the establishment lies. Sorry, establishment, which I've now become. But when I was a kid growing up, we were told the Vietnam was a good war. It was a good war. We were fighting. This was a good cause. We had to stop communism, etc. Now, let me be very clear. I am exceedingly grateful to everyone who has ever served in the United States military, particularly grateful to those that have served in combat. It is an amazing sacrifice they have made. I am in no way being critical of those who fought in the Vietnam War. I think when we look at history, though, we have to agree that the leadership of the Vietnam War at the presidential level was a bit of an embarrassment. We knew that Vietnam was not a place we were going to win, but for domestic political reasons, we stayed in Vietnam. It was not a great war. It was not saving the United States from communism. It was an internal domestic political question that allowed thousands of Americans to die. Many of us were opposed to the war. Many of us supported the war. But it, it was a very difficult time in American history. And many of us came away with from the, from the Vietnam War experience questioning whether we could trust things that the administration told us. Drugs. When I was a child, when I was young and growing up, this was the age of reefer madness. And we were told, look, if you ever smoke pot, that's it. You're, you're going to be in serious trouble. You're, you're, you're going to be drinking cheap wine by a dumpster for the rest of your life. You're, 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 you're terrible. Life, life will be a disaster. Well, I, I knew people in college that smoked pot, and some of them have turned out just fine, thank you. I will not name names. But we were told things that just by our own experience were untrue. And finally, Watergate. Nixon. And I worked for Nixon. I worked for the committee to reelect. I, I, I was a big Nixon fan, so I'm, I'm, I was in the boat. But Nixon stood there and said the American people need to know whether their president's a crook. And he was lying to us. He was doing things that were, were illegal and had to resign in disgrace. All of those things shook my generation and caused my generation to question authority. And, and we're a generation that's big on asking why. And, and we've been the Y generation since we were in our teens because we grew up in an environment where asking why was a, a thing that we learned to do from the world that we grew up in. Now, generational differences are almost always frustrating to quote the older generation. We'll talk more about this later. But it, it is a source of frustration and angst. And we'll get back to that we think about this, why my generation's the, the why generation. I also noted, though, that understanding someone in that 13 to 18 age range will help you understand who they are now. If you've listened to a number of these podcasts, some of you know me from class or other environments, uh, you have a, a bit of a feel of, of my personality. Well, let me tell you a little story about when I was in the 13 to 18 age group. When I was in high school, I was very involved in politics. As I said, I worked for the committee to reelect. Uh, I worked for, I was technically was the chair of the committee that ran the reelection campaign for the person who was president of the school board. I didn't really run the reelection campaign. He ran a political consulting firm, but he thought it was cool to have a student as chair of the committee. And I played some role. We knocked on doors. We did stuff. But anyway, I was very screwed into the politics of the school. There were a number of issues in the school that I played some role in. One of the big problems we had in school those days was people smoking in the bathroom, which I thought was stupid. A, I was not a fan of smoking, but mostly I wanted to be able to go to the bathroom without having to smell cigarette smoke. And kids were getting suspended for smoking, which didn't seem to make much sense to me because then they weren't in school. They weren't learning anything. Well, I worked with the administration, worked with the school board, and we got an outside smoking area, and the students agreed to keep it clean, and, and the thing worked. But I, I helped make that happen my, my sophomore year. So my junior year, I'm running for president of student council. Well, it was clear I was going to be president of student council. No one else was, was in the campaign, was running. 
And we have the, the big auditorium thing where everybody shows up. There's the program and everybody who's running for these various offices, running for student council, running for class offices, et cetera, is there. They're all announced. Some of them get to do a little shtick and speak. Um, the principal at the time, uh, I had served on the circuit screen committee, brought him in. I, I said to the principal, look, when it comes to president student council, which was last on the agenda, uh, I, I, I won't be on stage. Just announce Dale Fine, our candidate for president student council. And I'll, I'll, I'll take it from there. So he did. That was fine. Well, when he announces this, all the lights in the auditorium go out. It's black. Red, white, and blue spotlights come strobing around the auditorium. Alice Cooper, I want to be elected, comes on through the PA system. It was, it was kind of cool. White spotlights hits me. I come out of the crowd, come up, shake hands, go across the stage, go give some speech. When I'm done with the speech, the red, white, and blue spotlights start strobing around again. Alice Cooper comes back on. Red, white, and blue balloons drop from the ceiling. This was my campaign unopposed for president of student council. Those of you who know me, is it amazing if you think about it that the young man who at whatever, 16, organizes that kind of a campaign for student council president then ends up as a university professor standing in front of people talking, ends up doing podcasts? Um, you can kind of connect those dots. I think for all of us, if we can understand other people in that 13 to 18 age range not only does it help us understand potentially a cohort, people of this age, people in their 40s, this was the world when they were 13 to 18, this is going to impact who they are today. Not only is it useful for that, but it's useful at the individual level. If I'm interviewing people for a job, I like to ask the question, tell me about the world when you were 13 to 18. What was, what was the world like when you were in that age range? It's a very informative process. All right. So we've got the cohort effect. That's the one that everybody thinks about. When we talk about generational differences, almost always the focus is on, here's how young people today are different because, and, and we go into analysis. Um, one of the big ones now is, well, young people today, they, they have too much expectation. They, 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 they are just think they're entitled to everything. Because when they were young, they would go out and they play soccer and their team would play. And whether they won or lost, they always got a trophy. They got a participation trophy. And, and my generation can be very upset with young people because we think they're entitled because they all got participation trophies whether they won or lost. One of the things my students have pointed out to me, it wasn't their idea to have participation trophies. It was their parents who were organizing things. It wasn't 13-year-olds who demanded participation trophies. It was their parents who gave them participation trophies. So I think we got to think a little bit about how this occurred. But certainly what occurs in those ages does impact how people behave. I'm, I'm not denying that. But we put, I think, too much focus on that and not enough focus on what I would consider to be the second not secondary, but a second impact. And that's the normative, the age graded, the life stages impact on generational differences. Absolutely. I am different than younger generation folks. But as I like to ask my students, all right, am I different than you are? And the answer is yes. There are fundamental differences between Dale, the 65-year-old prof, and my 21, 22-year-old students in class. When we start thinking about what those differences are, how many of those are really cohort effects? How much are those that I grew up in Watergate, Vietnam, and I'm big in questioning authority, and how much of those differences are because I'm older? Arguably, I'm just old. Okay, I'm 65. I see the world differently than I did when I was 18. There has been, I hope, a whole bunch of transition in me from the 18-year-old Dale to the 65-year-old Dale. I don't think we put enough focus on this. Is I'm thinking about generational differences and how to manage interactions with individuals of various ages, I really try to focus on this. Now, this is lots of literature on this. There are a, a number of ways to look at it. There's the stages effect, which is a more, more psychological effect. Freud, Jung, Erickson were, were big in these kind of concepts. And, and the concept there is that there are stages of life. There are things that you are going through at this stage of life. At this stage of life, 
you're, you're experiencing being a newborn child and you're experiencing having parents and at a later stage of life, you're experiencing uh, getting married. There's a second approach, and I think these tend to blend together, a transitions, which is the stages approach, but it looks primarily on what's the, the transition between one and next, that those are critical aspects. Argument being that you can get stuck in a previous stage if you don't make the transition successfully. And, and some people, due to their life experiences, don't transition from one phase to the next. And finally, challenges. What are the challenges associated with being at different phases of life? So if we think of these phases of life, there are a number of them. When you're young, in that 13, 18, 22, whatever, you're in a finding yourself, if you will, phase. You're in a career prep phase. I, I, I like to think about this from a work side, not so much a family side as we're, we're thinking about leadership. But as I'm leading people up until that 18 to 22, their primary focus is on acquiring skills, learning how to be an employee, putting their career in motion, if you will. That's a, a big piece of that 18 to 22. As they age, the focus is on career growth, but it also moves into spouse, moves into children, moves into houses. There's an establishment phase that typically happens as you age. That is, this could happen early at 22. This could happen at 40. For some people, maybe it never happens. But you're, you're starting to become part of the society in a more established way. As I say, spouses, children, houses, cars, the kind of things that make you uh, part of the community, if you will. Then there tends to be a career growth phase where, okay, you've got a house. You may eventually be moving to a bigger house. You may be getting bigger cars. You may acquire a boat, place up north, et cetera. But you've got your, your career started and you've got your environment set in terms of homes and spouses and things. Often these, these can evolve. But now from a work side, you're looking at career growth. You're starting to think, okay, where do I want this career to go? I, I'd like to end up as the manager of this. I'd like to get promoted to that. I, I, I want to continue to work on the factory floor, but I, I don't want to do this. I want to do this job over here. I, I want to go from operating the, the press break to becoming a welder. You're, you're, you're refining your career and where you're going to go. That's a phase of life. There's a phase where your career plateaus. There's a phase, and this happens at different ages for people, where you say, okay, this is it. This, this is likely to be as far as my career is going to go. And for some people, this can happen relatively early, that in their late 20s, 30s, I've acquired a job, I'm working on a factory environment, I'm working as a welder, a, a fine job, doing well, but I'm going to be a welder. I'm going to be a long-distance truck driver. And I, I started being a long-distance truck driver at 30. I think I'll retire as being a long-distance truck driver in my 60s. And, and I have my career growth um, uh, pretty well done. And I'm now in a career plateau environment and I'm managing that kind of a transition. There's a phase where you are starting to think of your post work environment. And related to that, there's a phase where you are aware of the fact you're going to die. Now, Many of you would say, look, I, I, I know I'm going to die, Dale. What, 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 are you, what are you saying? That's kind of stupid. Well, yes and no. We know that while most people are aware of the fact they're going to die, they get it right on true false, it isn't really in their head. And that for many people, this transition occurs when their parents have died. So when you become next, when you start going to way more funerals than you go to weddings, you become aware of your own mortality in a practical, realistic, in-your-face perspective that you're not throughout your life. My personal bias, and I digress here for a minute, is that I think being aware of your own mortality is important. And, and many people, as you read about quality of life, will tell you that you have to be accepting of your own mortality. Uh, I like the, the expression, the concept, what I did today must have been important. I traded a day of my life to do it. And being aware that you only get so many days, I, I think, is important in terms of getting the most out of life. And now, a few words about some of the programs and services offered by the UW Oshkosh College of Business. The University of Wisconsin Oshkosh MBA Executive Program offers an array of scholarships supporting veterans, single parents, 
road warriors or those commuting more than 75 miles to attend class, employees of government and nonprofit organizations, and for those who make referrals for potential MBA executive students within their workplace or professional network. Eligible students may qualify for multiple scholarships. Visit uwo.sh slash MBA scholarships for more information and eligibility requirements. That's uwo.sh slash MBA SCH OLA RSH IPS. But as a leader, as I'm thinking about the folks that are in my organization, thinking about the folks that I'm follow that are following me, I need to be thinking about what are their career stages? What are they going on and what's going on in their life? Is, is this a, a young person who's focused on finding a spouse, getting married, uh, establishing themselves? Is this a person who's hit their career plateau? And what does that mean for them? I, this is the job I'm likely to retire from. Okay, how does that affect them psychologically? How does that affect what they're interested in? What's important to them? And I, I think we put far too much focus on young people today are different because of a cohort effect. Oh, they're, they're, they, they're way more entitled than we were when I was a kid. My perception is human nature has not changed much. As those of you who listen to these podcasts know, I'm a big believer in the concept of evolutionary psychology. A lot of human behavior, a lot of who we are, is ingrained in us from a genetic perspective, has evolved over time, just as surely as our physical capacities have evolved over time. Evolution doesn't occur over a couple generations. Evolution is a very, very slow process. So I totally reject the concept that young people today are in many ways fundamentally different than young people were a couple generations ago. I just don't think at the base that's true. They're going through different things in life than those of us that are older are going through. I think many of us, though, if we take a deep breath and think about what was I like when I was 18, what was I like when I was 22, and really think about that, the 22-year-old today, the 30-year-old today, not that different than you were. Are there differences at the margin? Absolutely. We're going to talk about some of those. But I don't think the fundamental behavior, the fundamental values are different. People often ask me, Dale, you teach at the university. You've been there for now uh, better than 30 years, almost 40 years. What do you see? What are the differences in students? And my biggest answer is, nope, there aren't many. They're, 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 students today are not fundamentally different than the students I had before. If I teach freshmen and sophomore, which I rarely do, fortunately, their biggest interest is, you know, finding other freshmen and soft, freshmen and sophomores, getting to know each other, going to the bars, drinking, doing what freshmen and sophomores do and what they did back 30 years ago, what I did when I was a freshman and sophomore. By the time they become juniors and seniors, they become more serious, more career focused because they're moving to that next transition. They can see the movement from academe into a job, a paying job. I would argue academia is a job for a student, but into a paying job is likely to happen soon. Are there some marginal differences? Yes. Students today graduate with way more student loan debt than when I was a student. I, I graduated debt-free. My parents had helped some, but you could work part-time while you were going to school and, and largely pay for a college education if you were frugal with your funds, as I had learned from my mother to be. Um, that You can't do that now. The cost of higher education is, is just too great. So they are graduating with more student loan debt. Does that influence the way they behave? Yeah. Are they more focused on trying to earn money quickly? Probably so. I would accept that because of student loan debt and other pressures. Are there other changes that have occurred across the generations? Absolutely. When I was a young person growing up looking for a job, people would apply for jobs. They would try and find a job. And they'd get a job working for a company. And then that would largely influence where they live. They would, oh, okay, I'm moving to Chicago because that's where the job that I got is. I'm moving to Denver because that's where the job I got is. Now, they may have accepted or rejected a job if they really didn't want to live in that city, but basically they followed career first and city just kind of happened. Young people today, and this amazes me, 
they moved to wherever. My, my son was in, one of my sons was in the Peace Corps, moved back from being in the Peace Corps for a couple years, lived with me for a year, which was great. Um, and then decided, okay, I'm going to move to Denver because I want to live in Denver. And once I get to Denver, I'll find a job. I was like, what? No, you find a job first. He's like, no, I'll move to Denver first. I'll live with friends I have in Denver and then I'll find a job. And I was like, what? I, 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 I didn't understand. I couldn't relate. That was not something my generation would have done. So there certainly are generational differences where there's a shift in the relative focus of how important is where you live. But don't underestimate the transitions of effect. Take a deep breath. Think about whether are these folks really different. Finally, the random individual effect. And, and this is one that we don't spend nearly enough time thinking about. Individuals are different. So people will vary to a huge extent across individuals, same generation, cross transitions, etc. So if I'm trying to understand a person, the best thing to do is to think of them as a person. Talk to them, listen to them, get to know them. As a leader, I need to understand the people that I am attempting to lead because I can't do servant leadership well unless I know what's important to them. Are they motivated by X? Are they motivated by money? Are they motivated by career growth? What's the combination of things that are important to them? And these are things that clearly change over time. I may be motivated by money one point in my career, another point in my career, I'm more motivated by time off. So you, you have to constantly be keeping tabs on your people. Okay, what are the differences, what are the criteria that we can look at and say, how are these different over time from across the various generations and across the life stages? Work-family balance. This clearly shifts across generations and it shifts over time. When you're young, prior to having being married, having a house, etc., you're pretty focused on quality of life issues away from work. You want to be able to spend time going out, socializing, doing those kind of things. You get married, you have a house, you have a house payment, you have a car payment. Well, now career starts to become more important because you, you need resources to support the lifestyle that you are trying to create. But then you start having a family. This may shift the balance. You may move to, oh, well, now that I've got a number of children, particularly as those children are in their, their elementary ages, I want to be able to spend time with them. I want to read to them. I, I don't want to stay at work late because I want to be home with my kids shortly after they get done with school so I can help with homework. I can read to them before they go to bed. So the work-life balance changes over time. Then when your kids are older, maybe it shifts again. I, I can remember thinking at one point, I want to spend more time with my kids. I remember at another point in time saying, well, my kids are all in junior high or high school. They really don't want to even admit they have a father. So my spending time with them isn't so much the name of the game. But they were looking like they wanted to go to college, which I was strongly encouraging. That was important to me. This made sense for most of my kids. So that was going to be a resource question. Spending more time at work, generating resources was now once again starting to trump spending family time because that's what I could do that was useful to the family. So these things change over time. Work ethic. There's a big discussion about the work ethic of young people. Lots of discussion that young people today, they don't have the same work ethic we did when I was young. And that this is, this is a problem. I, I simply don't think that it's true. When I look at my students in class, and I look at how hard they work, how hard they study. I, I simply reject the concept that young people today as a group don't have the work ethic that their parents did. I think it's different. I think their work-life balance is different. I think their concept of work time and non-work time is different. And that's a function of what they grew up with, the technology that they had, the life experiences they had growing up. I, I have staff that, quote, report to me at the university. I'm not wild about the report to phrase, but that are on the team that I have some responsibility in managing. And, and I'll text at all hours of the day and night questions, issues, things that I'd like them to, to get me feedback on. And I'm not expecting them to respond. It's just when it pops into my head, hey, I'd like this person's feedback, I, I, I go ahead and send the email because I want to take it off my to-do list. I'm not expecting a response until it's, quote, normal working hours. But I found that a number of the staff will respond at all hours of the day or night. 
And, and I'm like, wait a minute, Sam, why are you responding to this email at, at 10 o'clock at night? Um, you've got small children. Um, you should be focused on that. It's like, well, Dale, I was up. I have small children and a relative newborn. I'm dealing with one of my kids. While I'm dealing with that, I check the phone. I can knock out an answer now, get you the answer. I know it. And I want to take it off my to-do list. And, and it took me a while to accept that there's a fluidity of work roles and individual roles, personal roles, that young people feel that I don't have. I, I, I think many folks my generation think of work time and free time. And that you should have free time where you don't have to think about work, work time where you focus on work and you don't think about your personal issues. My experience has been many young folks really are intermingling those two. They don't think there's anything wrong with checking their Facebook page when they're at work, and they don't think there's anything wrong with answering a work question when they're, quote, not on work hours. That, to me, makes sense, kind of, when I think about it and I accept it, but it's a foreign concept to me. I, 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 I'm old school. I, I think of those two as different. So the work ethic has changed, but I don't think of it as they're not willing to work hard. What's important has changed in terms of work-life balance at various phases of their lives. Loyalty. Big discussion. Young people today are not as loyal as they used to be. Well, that, that simply is not what we have experienced. I know there's a lot of discussion, and now we're in the middle of the great resignation, and 50% of millennials are looking for a new job. So there's something going on now that is different, compounded by all the stuff we went through with the pandemic and isolation and working at home. But if you go back prior to the pandemic, people would answer the question, are young people today switching employers more frequently than they used to? And, and almost everybody would tell you the answer is yes. Oh, yeah, young people are changing employers way faster than they used to. Well, it turns out the U.S. Department of Labor, Bureau of Labor Statistics, keeps a statistic, which is average seniority in the United States. Average seniority in the United States has moves up and down. Periods of high unemployment, average seniority goes up because those folks with low seniority tend to drop out of the labor force, moving up the average seniority list, average seniority in the United States of the people that are working. Conversely, it goes down when the unemployment rate is relatively low because there are many more new entrants into the labor force and people who have only been working a short period of time. But that movement up and down is within a, a bounds that has been fairly constant since the 1950s. It's not true that young people, up until the pandemic, we will see how this plays out, have been faster to change employers, faster to change jobs because the rate of evolution in jobs has changed. The odds that you're going to graduate from high school, college, get a job, and be doing the exact same thing 45 years later when you retire. The odds of that have gone down because jobs are changing so rapidly. But people don't change employers a whole lot faster than they were 30 years ago. It, it is a perception, but it's not true. Young people today can be just as connected to place of work. But let's think about loyalty for a minute. I'm convinced that loyalty and work ethic, while they have not changed, we need to think about loyalty and what are people loyal to about. I'm convinced people are not loyal to a company. I've worked at the university for a long time. I think the university in the state of Wisconsin has been good to me. I thank you all the taxpayers and students who've paid tuition that have helped provide employment for me and have, have provided my salary. But I don't feel loyalty to all of that. I feel loyalty to individuals. And I think most people would say that their loyalty is not to a company, but is to a person. I think that was true a generation ago three generations ago, four generations ago, but is, uh, is, is true today. People continue to be loyal to individuals, and people will be very loyal, young people will be very loyal to an individual, to an employer who treats them with dignity and respect. Now, i got to come back to the why. Does my generation ask why more frequently than previous generations? Yes. And I do think this is an impact of what we call the cohort effect. My parents' generation, boy, somebody told my father, my grandfather to jump, an employer, he would jump and on the way up he'd ask how high. He did what he was told because that's what he was told to do by and large. 
my generation, and I believe the younger generations today, are much quicker to ask why. Oh, I want you to do X. Well, why should we do X? Why is X the right thing to do? And I know that can be aggravating to a lot of folks in leadership roles. I, I, I remember uh, riding in the car with my father, and there was a bumper sticker on the car in front of us that said, question authority. And my father grumbled something about that was a oh, communism. That's a bad thing. And I was like, no, question authority. That's a wonderful thing. That's what we're supposed to do. And he's explained to me why questioning authority is a bad idea. Um, I was a fairly reasonably well-read young man at, at 17. And so I quoted Jefferson back to him. The, the tree of liberty needs to be regularly fed with the blood of tyrants. I'm not sure if he was more impressed that I could quote Jefferson or more frustrated with me. But for many folks in an establishment perspective, they don't like it when people question their authority. I think there's a generational impact here, but I also think there's a life stages impact. As we age, we perceive ourselves as being wise, we perceive ourselves as being an authority, and many of us have a hard time with younger folks looking you dead in the eye and saying, why are we doing that? Why is that the right answer? And I, I think we need to get over the frustration with being asked why, because in many cases, most cases, what we ought to do is think about why. It's a pretty good question and usually worth some analysis. Now, as you've probably heard me say before, I am a believer that because I said so is one of the arrows that should be in your leadership quiver, that you should be able to look a direct report dead in the eye and say, I want you to do X. I don't want to talk about it. Go do it now because I said so. There may be pieces of information you have that they don't, that you can't share with them, things that you're privy to that they're not allowed to be privy to. There may be all kinds of reasons. There may be time constraints. So I'm okay with, I said so, as an explanation. And folks across the generation should be willing to accept, as the exception to the rule, an explanation of, because I said so. But my experience has been with younger folks, if you treat them with dignity and respect, you will generate the kind of loyalty that you can occasionally look them dead in the eye and say, because I said so, and they will do it. I believe that it's important to consider all of these effects, the co cohort effect, the life stages effect, and individual differences when you're thinking about how to motivate individuals. When you're trying to motivate younger individuals, I think you need to drop back and ask both of the questions, the cohort effect and the life stages effect. What's important to young people is different than what's important to older people. Benefits. A benefits package that is relatively rich, health insurance, retirement, that's a big sell to people in their 50s. It's not a big sell to people in their 20s. People in their 20s are not enamored with lots of health insurance. They're young. From their perspective, they're invincible. That's what's not going to recruit them. Career growth, career support, flexibility of time, those are things that are going to be more important to young individuals. The best way to figure out what's important to young folks that you're trying to recruit is to talk to young people and ask them the question, what's important to you? Generational differences. Bottom line takeaway, there are cohort effect differences. It's good to think about how young people are different than you are if you're an older individual because of the generational differences, the cohort, the lifestyles the things they've been exposed to. But I strongly encourage you to keep in mind that there are huge transitional differences. There are huge differences based on age. And don't underestimate the extent to which you are really very much like younger generation folks. Sorry, you're just older. And you have to accept that that's a difference and learn to manage that as you're figuring out how to manage young folks. Thank you very much for listening to another edition of It's Time Podcast. It's Time is a production of the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh College of Business Graduate Programs in association with Venture Project Studios. Executive producer, Aaron J. Armstrong. Host, Professor Dale Feinauer. Creative director, Madison Potratz. Director of photography, Elizer Klune. Audio and video editor, Elizer Klune. Marketing strategy, Tara Larson. Social media, Anwar Mahana. 
A special thanks to L Creative, Top View Media, Michael Patton, and the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh College of Business graduate programs.